Hi, uh, my name is Ying Zhang. I'm from Johns Hopkins. And uh, hi, Berkeley. Hi, Boston. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, the challenges of uh, persistent Lyme disease. Also has a name called the post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. So this is by far probably the most controversial issue surrounding Lyme. And in fact, all the problems surrounding Lyme may be, to some extent, can be boiled down to this disease condition. So let me start. So this is going to be an exciting and a bumpy wild ride. So buckle up, OK? <laughs> because everything we deal with this particular organism is different from conventional bacteria that cause human infections. So let's start. As you can see, the organism actually is very different from common bacteria that cause uh, bacterial infections. The bacteria can usually appear as a spirochetal organism, but change into round bodies, as well as into cyst forms and into biofilm-like forms. So when they change the forms, they change the antigen expression. And the immune response is actually uh, evaded. And during the process, they actually shed blebs, uh, such that they actually can cause the immune suppression and can cause immune dysfunction. So the consequence of all this is that the host defense mechanism doesn't work very well. And also, you get a variety of uh, different disease expressions. At, such as post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. And then the diagnosis becomes a problem because they have different forms, different antigen expression. The current test mainly detects a spirochetal form, which, by the way, may or may not be the most important form because the variant form may well be, which I'm going to argue, may be more important in the disease process and which, of course, we need more work. And also for treatment. These persistent forms of the disease is actually very difficult to treat. We think it also has to do with the change of the morphology into these more persistent dormant forms, such that they don't respond well to current Lyme antibiotics. So I think the disease, as we all know, is caused by the Borrelia and uh, Borrelia burgdorferi and related organisms mediated by the ticks. So that's covered by previous speakers. I'm going to move on. The disease is actually pretty complex. It has a continuous spectrum of the disease, starting with this early localized uh, EM rash, then go on to this early disseminated form, late disseminated form, such as arthritis, and to late stage post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, which which is more difficult to cure. So in the early stage of the disease, then it's quite remarkably this uh, treatment with three weeks, three to four week antibiotic with doxycycline and amoxicillin can cure about 80 to 90% of the patients, which is quite remarkable for such a heterogeneous disease. But still, about 10 to 20% of the patients in the other end of the spectrum, close to PDLDS, don't respond to current standard IDSC treatments, which is about a 30-day antibiotic treatment. Then this is where we have the other camp called ILADS, which propose essentially an open-ended treatment to try to focus these uh, late Lyme patients. So in a way, the IDSC seem to be focusing on the early Lyme patients, which actually responds quite well to the three to four week antibiotic treatment. However, that's not the complete picture. The complete picture, you have the other end of the spectrum, the 10 to 20 percent that don't respond to current treatment of three, four week antibiotic. This is the main issue here. But the ILS physician try to help here, but we're using strategies that do not seem to work very well so far, which I'll come back to why. Because this current Lyme antibiotics do not kill the persistent forms well, which we have some data to show you as we move on. So as I alluded to, this 10 to 20 percent of patients called PTLDS patients don't respond to current Lyme antibiotics. Then we have this various uh, 
NIH sponsored four clinical studies that actually shows that essentially uh, a mixed result in some trials that don't seem to see an effect with prolonged antibiotic treatment. In others, such as the CROP study as well as the Fallon study, they see some improvement in symptomology. But it's only temporary. It's not a cure. It's improvement in symptom. Okay. So it's a significant problem right now. And then also, more recently, there's this Dutch PLEASE study. I'm sure uh, many of you have read this. Uh, which actually says the long-term antibiotic treatment does not help the patient. Uh, where they did initially with two-week IV ceftriaxone treatment, followed by 12 weeks of doxycycline, or with clarithromycin plus hydroxychloroquine, and they don't seem to see improvement in symptomology. Um, it does not really, it just says only one thing, the current Lyme antibiotics do not work uh, on such patients very well, OK? So what causes this uh, PTLDS condition? This is really the key here. Because uh, the short answer is that we don't know, but it's a very heterogene heterogeneous disease condition where you can get uh, different factors involved. So there are different theories here. So one theory says that has to do with host immune response to persisting antigenic debris. The second theory says has to do with autoimmune response. The third theory has to do with co-infections, okay, because the ticks can carry different uh, pathogens. Uh, a related but distinct, uh, perhaps often overlooked, issue is probably secondary and opportunistic infection that actually comes from the Lyme disease initially, which actually suppresses the immune system, that may allow this opportunistic pathogens which don't cause disease in healthy individuals, but otherwise in Lyme may cause this opportunistic infection. This is an area we probably need to look uh, more clearly into. Another theory says that it's just a residual damage. You can't do very much residual damage to the, to the tissues already uh, due, due to this infection process. And the last possibility is what we are interested in. That is, it's due to persistent infection uh, as a result of persistence not completely killed by current Lyme antibiotics. And there is no FDA-approved treatment for this disease condition. As you can see, Patients actually suffer a great deal. They try all different sorts of uh, medications, supplements, very expensive. They don't really work very well. Okay? So it's a great unmet medical need here. So here I'm going to show you some evidence that supports the persistent infection theory, where in different animal models like mice, monkeys, dogs, it has been shown that standard treatment with doxycycline or ceftriaxone for 30 days do not completely clear the infection, as shown by molecular tests. But this is really where it's getting very intriguing, because the organism after treatment with antibiotics cannot be cultured. So it's in a state called viable but non-culturable. Okay? This is the term we still don't quite understand. Well, the, the term is somewhat controversial. The mechanism behind it is not very clear. And it's actually an important uh, issue. It has medically important implications for some persistent infections. So I'm going to show you the mouse study done by Steve Barthold's group at UC Davis, where they showed that mice infected with Borrelia, with the, this is an established infection. Okay? So if it's an early infection, it's relatively easy to cure, but you have to have an established persistent infection in a mouse model by infecting the mice for more than 30 days. Then you start the antibiotic treatment with 30 days after exome. Then you found that then you monitor the mice over the time course of two months, four months, eight months, and 12 months. And initially, two, two, two months to eight months, you don't see anything. Okay? in the different mouse tissues. When you do molecular test, nothing is there. 
all tests are negative. However, by the end of 12 months, by 12 months, you started to see the signs of the Borrelia coming back. It's called a resurgence phenomena. This is really very interesting, uh, but poorly understood phenomena that really has to do with the relapse of the disease, has persistence. It's really a great example that shows a persistence problem. And they come back, yet in a form that cannot be cultured. They really said that we're, in fact, uh, at the forefront of the bacterial persistence. This is something that people, even who work in this very area, do not understand. Okay, we, among with other labs, work on this spectral persistence mechanisms as well as uh, developing drugs. But then, this is a phenomenon that has stunned us. We don't have an explanation. We don't know. That means the organism must be there and have replicated in such a manner that cannot be grown. Okay, this is really quite amazing. We still have a lot to learn. And uh, you know, it's not like some people said we know everything about Lyme. That's just not true. Lyme is such a complex disease, and the bacteria are so tricky, so crafty, and then they change different forms, and it's a very difficult problem. Not only in vivo, they show this persistence problem, in vitro as well. We and other labs have shown that in vitro, the current Lyme antibiotics like doxycycline and moxicillin do not kill the persister forms enriched in stationary phase bacteria. While the kill the log phase growing forms quite easily. Okay? So you might wonder, what is the implication? Why, 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 are, why are persistors important? Okay? So I'm going to show you this cartoon, which is very cool. Okay, I'm thinking you're going to like it. That is a dandelion phenomenon. Okay? So the current Lyme antibiotics is like the mower okay? that just chop off the top part. Okay? That's the growing part. The top part, but then the root is still there. You can see, it's probably hard to see, but the root is still there. Okay, when you remove the antibiotic, they cause relapse, because the root is still there, the persister problem, okay? Then you need, what you need is a shovel, like this, to dig out the root, okay? So that the whole thing dies out, okay? Luckily, in the case of tuberculosis, we have one such drug, like the shovel, that is called parazinamide. Okay. That's a persister drug. How do we know this is important? Because in the case of tuberculosis treatment, we know the persister drug, parazinamide, is critical for shortening the TB therapy as well as reducing the relapse. That's a persister drug only. It has no activity against the growing forms, only attack the persister forms. Okay. So in the TB field, people know that, in fact, you need a drug combination approach in order to cover different bacterial populations that are growing, like uh, azanazid is a drug that kills the growing form, and rifampin is antibiotic that kills both growing and non-growing form, and parazinamide is a drug that kills its non-growing persister form. You need all three drugs in combination in order to more effectively cure TB. Uh, but this same principle can be applied to Lyme. And this is indeed what we found. The drug combination, the triple drug combination, which I'm going to talk to you about later, is exactly like this in analogy. Okay? You need three types of antibiotics in order to take care of the entire bacterial population for more effective irradiation, uh, eradication of the persistent form of the disease. So when we started, there was no antibiotics active against the Borrelia persister forms. So we have to design or develop a new high-throughput viability assay, and then did screening of FDA drug library, as well as NCI compound library, for activities against the Borrelia persister forms. So we found a range of drug candidates that are active against such forms, including daptomycin, which is used to treat MRSA, and also clofazamine, which is a leprosy drug, and also have very good activity against Borrelia persistens. Sulfur drugs, okay, which I just actually heard uh, from uh, Dr. Leisure here, uh, that she had some good experience with that. And, and also artemisinin, okay, anti-malarial drug, that also have good activity against Borrelia persistens. 
So while we were evaluating these persistor-active drugs, we found that, in fact, there are different types of persistors. There are these planktonic free-living form, like the spirochetal form or round body form, that's relatively more easy to be killed by persistor-active drugs we identified. However, this is a more resistant form, like a microcolony uh, form, and like this uh, biofilm-like. Okay, is an aggregated form. That's uh, much more difficult to be killed by even the persistor-active drugs we identified. We found this is where we found a drug combination approach is required. This is actually is shown by here. You, as you can see. This on the left panel is a control without adding any drugs. The green, you see green aggregated cells. Green cells means live cells. Red cells means dead cells. Okay? Treatment with single antibiotic, ceftriaxone, a lot of green cells. Treatment with doxycycline, a lot of green cells in aggregate don't work very well. But treatment was daptomycin. You see some red cells. That's when is that daptomycin is active against such forms. But alone is not able to take care of all these aggregated forms. And also you can see doxycycline plus cefepirazone here, uh, which is actually E, panel E, a lot of green cells. That means it doesn't work very well. So that means not any drug combination is going to work. It has to contain persistent active drugs like daptomycin. So we found the two drug combinations is not quite sufficient. We need three drug combinations that will be able to attack all different forms for more effective eradication so that they don't even grow uh, in subculture studies. So for the key questions for the future, of course, the first thing we wanted to test is whether such drug combinations that eradicate the Borrelia persister forms actually work in vivo, in animal models, as well as in patients, of course. But then we wanted to know what really causes this PTLDS condition. And there these different possibilities now can be addressed, can be tested. And also, can we culture the viable but non-culturable form? Okay, So that we can develop a better test for detecting these uh, viable but non-culturable forms. And also, whether there are any biomarkers used for diagnosis, as well as biomarkers for uh, disease prediction. That is, whether there are biomarkers that predict a biological cure. And finally, whether we can really harness the immune system okay, that can really, you know, take care of the PTLDS condition, because so far, uh, immune system must be important in controlling the pathogen. But so far, we have not been able to find an effective way to stimulate the host immune system to better control such persistent infections. So as you can see, there's still a lot to be learned, a lot to be done. And, but I think there is uh, potential hope and uh, you know, I hope uh, you actually enjoy the ride as much as I have. And, uh, you know, but we need really your innovative ideas and action from each one of you so that we can really address the pressing needs of persistent Lyme disease. Thank you for your attention.